Freedom is not free. It has a price. It has a cost. Yesterday we celebrated Veterans Day, and it's a regular reminder of the price that many have paid for our freedom. And so again, freedom is not free. One writer wisely said, America will remain the home of the free only as long as it's also the home of the brave. And so we can certainly thank God for the many brave men and women throughout history who have made our physical freedom possible. But as valuable as physical freedom is, God's desire for us is so much deeper. God wants you and me to be free spiritually. See, even here in this free country, far too few are really free. Why? Because the world is in slavery to sin. And spiritual prisoners of war abound everywhere. The devil is the ultimate evil tyrant and dictator. And God wants us to be free wherever we find ourselves. Free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, both of those. And one day, from the presence of sin. What a wonderful thing that is to look forward to. But there's really only one way to spiritual freedom. No external law could ever set us free, no matter how good it is. No religious ritual, no matter how important that might seem, could set us free. No power of our own, no ingenuity that we have, no ability that we have could set us free. Freedom is found spiritually in only one place, and that is God's grace. And so the theme of Galatians, as we're studying that book together, is spiritual freedom. But God knows freedom is never free. You have to fight for it. You have to defend it. You have to guard it against attack. And that's exactly what Paul is doing in this letter. Wherever you find freedom, you're going to find those who seek to steal it, who seek to take it away, who seek to put you back into some form of slavery. You might find, again, that the Apostle Paul... He could be called a freedom fighter. You see, Paul was set free. He was the apostle with the heart set free. And now, Paul was fighting for the freedom of others by bringing the message that frees people, the one message that frees people spiritually. That's the gospel. And it's that simple statement that through faith in Jesus, through the sacrifice that he made, everyone, everywhere, can be set free from every sin and from death. And so eternal life, it's a free gift of God's grace. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't be good enough for it. There's no ceremony. There's no ritual. There's nothing in the world that you could do to buy a spot in heaven for you or for anyone else. And nothing we can do can add to what Jesus has already done. That's the important bedrock of Christianity, faith alone in Jesus alone. And we need to understand that as much as we might nod our head to that or in our heart say yes to it, that message was radical in Paul's day. It was the exact opposite of what Paul grew up with. It was the exact opposite of what the culture taught and thought. It was the exact opposite of what people preached. And as we'll see in tonight's study here, tonight's chapter, Galatians 2, even strong Christians, even those who know better can lose their grip on the gospel for a time. And the old bondage can be back. The legalism can come and creep back into any life, no matter how strong that Christian may be at some point in their life. And so the message of the gospel was radical then, but it's radical now, maybe even more radical today than in Paul's day. Because most of the world, in fact, many of your friends and family, maybe even some sitting here tonight, believe that some set of ceremony, some set of rituals, some rules or regulations are the way to really get in good with God. And even those who say that salvation is by grace, well, often they find themselves practically living and expecting others to live as if it really was by works. And so Paul is part here of a worldwide war for freedom, and that's a whole lot of ground to cover, as we'll see here tonight. And he was one who was trying with his life to set as many free as he possibly could. And so Paul would preach grace in a place for a while, let it take root, and then he would leave town. He would go on to the next battleground. And so after Paul would leave town, false teachers would come back in, try to undo 
the victory that Jesus had won in that place. Judaizers is what they called them. It was Jesus and people, you know, where it's, oh yes, Jesus is cool, but also this other long list here. Jesus plus. And the whole thing is, anything that you try to do to add to the gospel only really subtracts from it, ultimately. But people put back into bondage by this set of beliefs, by thinking they must earn or deserve, or that they possibly could earn or deserve God's favor through some set of rituals, some set of regulations, some long list or even short list of good works. And so a bit of background here, putting us back into the thoughts of Galatians. Legalism, that's going to be the issue here. Legalism, the word there, legal or law, you see that. And freedom is not found by keeping the law. That is the basic gospel message. And as we talk about law, we're not talking about the speed limit per se. When uh, the first century folks would read that word, the law, they knew what they were talking about there. It was the Ten Commandments, the law of God, the ceremonies and sacrifices that are found in the Old Testament. And specifically, as you'll see, circumcision, which was a sign of that set of ceremonies and a symbol. Hey, I will keep God's law. I will be obedient. I will be good. And so that's what you were seeing, the Jews saying, through this circumcision. And what we see is that the flaw was not in the law. This is real important to understand. The flaw was not in the law. That, that's not why God brought in the gospel of grace. No, the flaw was in us. We couldn't keep it. God's purpose for the law, it was to show our flaw, to show our need. Jew or Gentile, all alike, under sin, needing a Savior, and for grace. That's why God put the law there in the first place, to expose so that we would embrace grace. And the human response, it was so interesting, so much the way we are. Well, we can't keep the law. I know. Let's add more laws. Let's make it more and more and more complex. Over time, Judaism, that's exactly what happened. It grew far beyond God's law. It complicated everything, became a web of man-made rules and regulations. And so here's Paul preaching something so contrary to that culture, to everything that people have been brought up with. And it was a non-Jewish area here, a Gentile area. That's what Galatia was, a, a whole set of cities. And so Paul preached the gospel to them. And what was it? Well, he said, yeah, it's true, guys, you are sinners, lawbreakers. You know, even you who don't know the law that well, you've broken it, the law of God. But Jesus died for your sins, and by faith in him, and by that faith alone, you can be forgiven and free. New life, new hope, new beginning, all of those things. Not law, but love an internal, eternal change from the inside out. And so you can picture the joy that that would bring to a life, especially if you've experienced it yourself. You know, the Galatians, they're saying, yeah, man, we are free in Christ. God's given us grace. He's given us peace. He's given us hope. He's given us a new direction in life. But then along came, bum, 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 the Judaizers. And what did they have in their hand? Well, I call them the circumcisors, you know? <laughs> The garden clippers, there. You don't think God could actually save you just by your faith, do you? No, 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 we got to sniff some stuff. We got to sniff for some additional sin. We got to find all kinds of things going on in your life. You have to be circumcised. You have to keep the Sabbath. And you go, well, maybe I'll do the Sabbath thing, but I'm not so sure. What was that first thing all about? You have to keep the law of Moses if you want to be forgiven and free. Well, what else is in there if that's where it starts? You know, that sort of thing. Now, again, just summarizing it, it's not my words, it's theirs. Acts 15, 1, if you jot that down and look it up later, this is what it says. Unless you are circumcised, according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's how simply the Judaizers were saying it. And that was causing all kinds of confusion in the church, as you might imagine. And Paul heard that these false teachers here had begun to lead the Galatians away from the simplicity of the gospel, of God's grace, and back toward legalism. And it made him fight and mad, and rightly so. And the letter has a passion to it. It has a strength to it. There's a lot of things that Paul says that you go, wow, is that Christian to say that? Well, it is, because he felt very strongly about these things, and God has his heart put into these things. The letter is a very passionate fight for freedom. Again, realizing that freedom is not free. You have to protect it. You have to 
Put a guard around it sometimes. The gospel of God's grace, it is worth protecting. And salvation is free. Salvation sets you free. But that's a freedom that sometimes has to be fought for. And it is a freedom that's worth fighting for. And so we'll see it in, in the first verse here of Galatians 2. Paul picks it up with a, a continuing statement. He says, Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Now, stopping right there in verse 2, I just want to give you two words to write down on your page or in your brain, which is be free. Be free. That is the first thing that Paul is going to put into our hearts and minds. It's that God's will is that we be free, personally, spiritually. Remember from chapter 1, if you will, that Paul was telling his testimony. He's in the middle of his story as the chapter cha changes over. You know, he, that's why he's saying, and then I did this. He was already giving the first half of his story last chapter. And it wasn't a tale of wild, worldly wickedness. You know, his testimony, maybe you've heard one of those, you know, I was a drug dealer, I was a mafia boss, I was a gang member, I was a gambler, I was a womanizer, I was all of these things, you know. Well, that's some people's testimony, but it wasn't Paul's. Paul's confession, I was a very moral man. That was it. He says, I was a good Jewish boy. In fact, a very good Jewish boy, a religious ruler, one who never really, by anyone's estimation, did anything wrong. People wouldn't have looked on and said, mwah, 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 Paul really needs to change, turn things around. No, in fact, he was one who people say, why couldn't you be more like Paul, you know, growing up, that sort of thing. He used to be a legalist, though. He used to think that he could earn and deserve God's favor. He was later to say, I was the worst kind of sinner. What kind of sinner is that? The one who thinks they aren't a sinner and that everyone else is. A self-righteous guy. See, Satan doesn't mind if you're righteous as long as it's self-righteous, as long as it's that puff up in pride kind of righteousness that says, I'm a pretty good guy. And so he thought he deserved heaven, certainly, and that everyone else deserved hell, certainly. That was Paul's perspective. Now, giving a little time frame here in his life, he says, after 14 years, what was that milestone that happened in his life that he's pointing back to? Well, it was a time that is the line between B.C. and A.C. Now, some of you are saying, isn't that a rock band? No, that's A.C.D.C. That's something else entirely. But B.C., A.C. is before Christ, after Christ. That was it. He could point to a time in his life where he said, there was a change in my life. Even though many people thought I was moral and I thought I was a pretty good guy, there was still a major turnaround and timeline in my life. And he could point to that time. And I hope everyone in this room can say there was an, a BC time in my life and an AC time in my life. And if you can't say that, then tonight is the night for you to draw that line and to come over to the AC side. Now, Paul here, he knew what it was to be bound up in religious self-righteousness. And he knew what it was now to be free. And so here he is saying, hey, be free. I know what it is to be bound. I know what it is to be free. And let me assure you, freedom's better. So he's out practicing, he's out preaching the gospel of grace, fighting for people's freedom, and specific, specifically fighting for Gentiles to be free. And those were ones that he had once hated with a passion. And so Paul wasn't fighting alone. I think it's interesting. He had some free friends here. Paul hung out with people who lived for the gospel. And that's a great thing to do. And let it rub off on you. See, that's exactly what was happening in his life. He had people who, instead of making him more ungodly, they actually helped him be more godly. They rubbed off on each other. Barnabas and Titus, we see him there in the scripture. Barnabas was a Jew and Titus was a Gentile. You know, a great mix there. All three free in Christ. And they had taken many trips together. They had fought many fought and fights for freedom together. And here, Paul tells of a specific trip that they took, one that was very memorable, and it was to Jerusalem. And this is interesting. Pay attention because it says that they went there not to preach to unbelievers, which was the normal thing that they would do, but to meet with believers. Why were they doing that? Well, specifically, they met with Peter. You'll also see him called Cephas in here. It's the same guy just a nickname for him. You see also James, the brother of Jesus, and a guy named John. Now, these should be, in some ways, some familiar names to us 
because they are bigwigs in the first century of Christianity. These are the names that everyone would certainly know here. And so notice with me, he says, I had a little private closed door meeting. The press wasn't invited to this one. Why? Because he said, I was a little concerned that I might have or would run in vain. Now, some would look at that and say, wow, was Paul concerned that his message wasn't right? Was he concerned that the gospel wasn't true or that somehow he had missed the message? Well, not at all. If you read Galatians all the way through, it's very clear that Paul was very clear on his message and his ministry. He knew exactly where it had come from. It had come from God, and he wasn't at all uh, nervous about that or anything else. But he knew that he was on the right side of the war, but he still knew it was a war. He still knew it was a war. And apparently Paul was concerned about one thing, which is that he didn't know exactly how far this war had gone for the hearts and minds. Paul knew that it was possible that the Judaizers had somehow even originated there out of Jerusalem because certainly uh, Jesus' followers, if you pay attention in the Gospels, they didn't always get it so right. You know, his disciples were sometimes the ones who got it wrong more than anybody else. And so even the apostles, well, they were capable as human beings of making mistakes. And so even the ones who followed Jesus first could certainly go off course. And so Paul's here acting wisely because he says, you know what, I don't want anything to hinder the ministry that God is doing so effectively there among the Gentiles. And if I make a big fuss here, it can only hurt down the road. So speaking privately there, he goes to the leaders, those, he said, who were of reputation before any debate went public. What was the result? Well, it's great because verse 3, it says, not even Titus, not even this Gentile who was with me, being a Greek, in other words, being a non-Jew, he said even he wasn't compelled to be circumcised. You know, uh, Peter, John, James there, they didn't say, all right, bring out the scissors. No, see, Titus was a test case, a very important one. He was a Gentile. See, it's one thing to preach something, but then how do you do it in practice? You know, they had already said, oh, no, 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 uh, we accept everyone. And then, uh, you know, if someone comes to Christ, they're a brother of mine, that sort of thing. And then they say, well, how about Titus? Well, yeah, they embraced him. See, he wasn't circumcised, but he was very obviously a saved man. He was a guy who had borne much fruit for the gospel. And so the leaders in Jerusalem there, they made the right choice. They stood on the side of freedom. And that's important for us to see. Titus didn't need to be a Jew to follow Jesus. Very important to see. So what was their message? In a couple of words, be free. That was it. That's what you see them saying. And now verse 4, it says, and this, he's talking about this meeting in Jerusalem, occurred because, I had to have this meeting because, false brethren. Did you know that it's possible for, uh, you know, attacks on the church to come from within? Of course they do. He says, they secretly brought in they came in by stealth, you know, not the airplane, to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. See, those are kind of war words there, that they might bring us into bondage, that they might take us in as prisoners of war, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seemed to be something added nothing to me. Now again, continuing with that thought, be free. This is what Paul is saying. It was worth fighting for. It was something that he knew he would have to fight for. And maybe even in some ways, with some folks that he never would have thought he would even have to be discussing this with. But just because Paul was free doesn't mean that he acted without any restraint or without any respect. He wasn't some kind of wild-eyed radical anarchist, you know, with no accountability in the church saying, hey, I'm free, I follow Christ, and I don't listen to anybody. No, he was a guy who did respect some things. We see that. He's a respectful man here. But he wasn't in awe of them to the point that he would put an exalt, a messenger, above the message. Very important to see that. Often people do that in the church where they'll say, well, uh, Bishop so-and-so said it, or so and you know, this guy, and look at all the degrees he has. So I'll, I'll believe him. But what Paul was saying is, look, the gospel, it's recorded in the scriptures. We can understand it. And even if an angel or even if an apostle says something different, well, we don't have to listen to it. And so Paul here, he was no politician. It's important to see in the negative sense of the word. He was not out kind of collecting popular votes, you know, trying to drum up support. He was not polling people to find out what the truth was. He wasn't saying, well, you know, where should I stand on this issue of the gospel? What does 
CNN say? What does Fox News say? You know, that sort of thing. No, he went to the leaders. He recognized their role. But he wasn't about to be intimidated by them into changing or modifying his message. And so Paul's highest allegiance was to the truth, and ours ought to be also. That is the truth that sets people free. It's the truth that will keep us free is the truth that keeps others free. And so he was relieved to report, I believe, right here, the apostles added nothing to my message. He said, they seem to be something. A lot of people think they're pretty special. I'm sure they are. But you know what? They didn't add anything. So if you're, if you're really in awe of them and you think, oh, well, the apostles, I'm sure, know a lot more than Paul. Well, they didn't say Jesus and. They said Jesus and that's it. No set of ceremonies added. Verse 7, he says, to the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. He who works effectively in Peter for the apostleship of the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. What is Paul saying? Why is it important to us? Think about this. It's so important to us because he's saying there's only one gospel. It's one gospel for the whole world. Different spheres, different approaches, different methods maybe, but the same message. The message never changed. The messengers can change. The methodology may change. The way of bringing that but the message has to be absolutely central. Notice the wording that he says there. He says, he who worked effectively. He wasn't pointing to himself. He wasn't saying Paul, who worked very effectively with the Gentiles, if I do say so myself. No, he wasn't saying Peter, who did pretty well with the Jews, I guess. No, it was God behind it all. And so God's behind the message. And anywhere the gospel bears fruit, ultimately it's not the messenger. It's the message and the person behind that is God. And so you see when James, verse 9, Cephas, that's Peter again, and John, who seem to be pillars. Can you get the idea that Paul's really making sure that nobody can put a person on a pedestal? He says, when they perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So you see here, pillars, VIPs, recognized names. You know, again, apostles, people who would have had a lot of reputation in the town and all that. The big boys give their endorsement to Paul. And he says, for whatever that's worth, did that mean something to you? Well, it doesn't mean that much to me, but it apparently does to some. So he says, it's obvious here, God has his stamp of approval, and they do too, on what we're doing here. Barney and Paul and Titus, even though they had a different role than James and John and Peter. And this is why we can take so much mileage out of this. Why? Because I know that in the church world, one of the biggest problems that happens is that when there's differences of ministry, people don't give each other the right hand of fellowship. They give each other the left foot of disfellowship. You know, boom, get out of here. You're not of us, that sort of thing. You know, not invented here and all that. But this is the point. If the message is the same, well, same God, same goal, different people for different places, and the more spiritual a person becomes, as we see here in the scripture, the less territorial they will be. The less they will be, well, what brand are you? You know, what, how can I label you and put some kind of little category so I can put you in it? And it's so important to see that so often we're just fighting the same war on different fronts. That's exactly what you see in the life of Paul. And so it says they desired only that we should remember the poor, verse 10, the very thing I was also eager to do. I just want to take a moment of sidestep there to just say this is a great reminder. Why? Because this is a very doctrinal uh, letter. You know, each one of the different Bible books are different. And Galatians is one that you have to put your thinking cap on some because Paul is drawing some very fine lines. He's saying this is the, the truth and it's worth fighting for. But one of the things that he throws in here, and God makes sure that we see, is that correct doctrine is never a substitute for Christian duty. You know, all the way through, he's making sure we know we're not saved by good works. But don't forget we are saved for good works. I mean, don't lose facts here. Don't lose sight of the fact that uh, there is a world out there that isn't just asking to be spiritually free, but to be physically free. And in this meeting, they didn't just discuss theoretical theology and come to a conclusion, yes, 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 it's true, we have the truth. They reminded each other about the reality of spiritual and physical needs. And so often the church, again, has been guilty of fighting amongst ourselves about some little legalistic fine point of practice while the unbelieving world goes to hell hungry and hurting. And that's why it's really exciting for me to stand on this stage surrounded by boxes of things that are going out with the gospel in them, but also 
toys to play with, things for kids to rejoice in, and all that. Very exciting to see that we don't lose track of that as well. And so this example, the uh, best one I could think of, uh, was found in, in Pastor Chuck Smith, who started the first Calvary Chapel, or who God used to start, I should say. And in the late 60s, there were some hippies who started coming to the church, you know. New carpet had just been put in at this point, you know, and, and everyone had voted on it and all that sort of thing. And someone put up a sign as these hippies started coming that said, no bare feet allowed in the sanctuary, because we all know that God doesn't like bare feet. And so Pastor Chuck saw that sign. It wasn't he who put it up, and he asked, hey, what, what's, that, what's with the sign? You know, what, who put that up? And one of the people there said, well, we put it up because these kids are dirty and they need a bath and they need a haircut and they are going to ruin our new carpet. And that's when Pastor Chuck said, look, then we're going to pull our new carpet up and we're going to go to a bare floor for bare feet if that's what it takes to reach a generation for Christ. Now, that's the example, and yet so few think in that way. They, they think of their purity, but they don't necessarily remember purity not only of doctrine, but purity of duty. And so good works are not bad. Never lose sight of that. Good works are not bad. We're just not saved by them. We're saved for them. And so be free. That's what he talked about. Acts 15 gives the details of that decree if you want to look it up. And so everyone agrees. You know, they go to Jerusalem. Everyone, one big kumbaya party be free. We're just going to go be free. And so salvation's by faith in Christ alone and by faith alone and all that. So they got it right and they never had to address that issue again, right? Wrong. See, it's been said again that eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. What does that mean? Well, freedom isn't free. It means there is a duty there is a thing that we have to do, which is not just to be free, but to make sure that we may have to fight to even stay free. In other words, the fight for freedom is an ongoing one, not just over and done with. You see the truth of Paul's words found there in verse 11, that he wasn't just to be free, but he, he needed to make some efforts to make sure that people stay free. Verse 11, it says, when Peter... Why is it always got to be Peter? Don't you feel sorry for Peter? I kind of do, but I kind of don't. I'm really glad he's always like that because I can really identify with him. You know, early in my Christian life, I thought Paul was going to be my example. And then I made a bunch of mistakes. I said, I'll pick a new hero. I'll get uh, Peter. Peter. Peter will be my guy. I'll learn a lot. I'll be like him. And so Peter had come to Antioch. I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrites with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Now, it's really important to see, you know, every once in a while, somebody maybe even from a Jewish background would read this and say, see, they're against the Jews, the Bible's anti-Semitic. No, no, Paul was a Jew of Jews. He's saying, when he's saying the Jews, he's talking about his friends and his folks. So... What you see here is some of the very people who had stood with Paul and in really in reality stood with God on the side of liberty, in, on the side of freedom in Jerusalem actually began to practice legalism later in life. Just a little while down the road, they're right back to their old tricks. Now, what's happening here? Well, you see that eating in those days was intimacy, even more so than today. Today, we might eat with someone and it's no big deal. But remember, this was family-style eating, and there were no double-dipping rules, you know? So if you had nachos with, uh, with a heathen, you were going to get some of their slobber on it, that sort of thing. And so you see here Acts chapter 10, really important. You know, this was a big, big, big deal. Often Jesus was accused of eating with the wrong people, you know, that sort of thing. And so Acts 10, if you rewind the tape back to there, you'll see that Peter, as a good Jew, Peter was brought up with rules and regulations that had to do with that. You know, his parents would have said, don't you ever eat that, and don't, most of all, don't you ever eat with that kind of person. And so God, in Acts chapter 10, tells him, go to the house of a Gentile. And Peter does what Peter did, which is argued with the Lord. It's one of the funniest things in the Bible when you often see Peter saying, no, Lord. You ever said that? That's an argument you'll never win. No, Lord. You know, it's almost an oxymoron there to be saying, uh, no, 
Lord. You know, Lord, you don't tell them no. But it's there Peter saying, I would never, ever, 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 ever eat with a Gentile. I would never, ever, 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 ever dine on swine. It's true, I'm a Christian now, and I, I've got that freedom. But, you know, I still believe I'm a little better with God because of my kosher diet, because of the kind of company that I keep. And so God does eventually win the argument, as he always does. You know, it's just a matter of time. And so God changes Peter, sets him free, further freedom. It's not about food, Peter. Don't you remember when I was teaching that stuff? It's about faith. It's about love. It's about grace. It's about what's in your heart and what comes out of your heart, not what goes into your mouth and into your stomach. And for a while, you see Peter, the freedom eater. That's what you see. You see him doing real well. Around the table with Gentiles there in Galatia, you know, laughing, telling stories of, of Jesus. Oh, yeah, you know, the Pharisees used to get on his case and all that. Hey, pass the bacon bits, you know, <laughs> on the thing. Here, Peter, have some more. You know, pulled pork, pan con lechon. That sort of thing. And... <laughs> Peter here, he's free. And he's free. He's having a great time. And mm, this is good, you know, that sort of thing. Jew and Gentile enjoying the freedom they find in, in God's grace. And then something happened. Jews came from James. Jews came from Jerusalem. And Peter stopped sitting with the Gentiles. Now, this wasn't James' fault. James already talked about what it is, and we've seen what James was about. But some guys come there from his place, from Jerusalem, and Peter stops eating with the Gentiles. You can picture it there. Hey, Peter, come on over. Tell us some more stories, man, the Gentiles. Uh, no, thanks, guys. Uh, I think I'll sit over here in kosher corner this week, you know? That's what I'm going to be about. And Paul uses a real strong word for it there in verse 13. He says, hypocrisy, man. You're a hypocrite. He was a hypocrite. And the word means Actor. That's the literal meaning of the word in Greek. It was that they would wear a mask. They would wear two masks. You've seen it in Greek theater where you have the happy face and the sad face and all that. That's what he's saying. He says, you are a pretender. And this is a very special sin. It's one we've got to be very careful of because Jesus talked about it a lot. But hypocrisy is kind of reserved for the religious, isn't it? I mean, what would a heathen hypocrite look like? Lie, tell their parents, I'm going out drugging and drinking, and actually sneak to church. I mean, what... <laughs> What would you do as a heathen hypocrite? It, you can't really do it. So this is a special sin. This is one we've got to be careful about as believers. And the worst part about hypocrisy, it was catching. It was contagious. He says there in verse 13, even Barnabas. That's a word of shock kind of on Paul's part. He's saying, man, even Barney went bad. I can't believe this. Barnabas, the guy who had stood up for Paul. When Paul first became a believer and the Christians didn't believe that Paul was a believer, they said, no, nah, this is a trick. This can't be. Nobody like Paul could get saved. Barnabas, the one who brought Paul originally to Antioch to preach to the very gospel, the very gospel to these Gentiles now, they was actually Barnabas who brought Paul to do that. Barnabas, a man who traveled around on so many missionary Trips, preaching the gospel that, hey, God accepts the Jews and Gentiles alike in Christ. And you see several things here. The responsibility that comes with visibility. See, this is really important. What we practice is way more often seen than what we preach. And the power of fear pressure, the power of peer pressure, it always seemed to be working in, especially, Peter. The fear of man, the Bible says, will bring a snare. What does that mean? It means that you will be trapped by it. It's so easy to get, if you care what people think of you, it will always, always be tough to do what God has called you to do. And so verse 14, when I saw that they were not straightforward with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Now notice in verse 11, it says he withstood him to his face. And I like that. One of the things that happens occasionally around here is we get anonymous you know, emails that are like, you guys are messed up here, there, there, and there, and there, and there. Signed, love, anonymous. You know, and you go, oh, come on, man. <laughs> come on. What you see here is he talks to him face to face. Not about Peter behind his back, but to Peter face to face. 
And this is in contrast to the Judaizers, you know, who, who like to stir things up after Paul was gone. You know, Paul leaves, and then they go, mm -mm -mm -mm, sneak back in, you know, like a bunch of roaches, and talk about him behind his back. And, you know, you might say, well, wouldn't it have been nicer? Wouldn't it have been more Christian to just kind of rebuke Peter privately? Well, remember, again, Peter was a very public person. He kind of forfeited the right to private rebuke when he had a very public personality, a very public ministry, and a very public sin. And public sin from a public person, as the Bible shows so many times, requires sometimes a public rebuke. And so Paul here asked Peter, why are you expecting them to do what even you do not do? Now, I can imagine it was pretty quiet over in kosher, kosher corner of the cafe at this point. You know, it's kind of like Peter going... Now, if there's one thing you can say about Peter, he was a sinner, but you know what's great? He was a great repenter. All throughout the Bible, it doesn't say what he did here, but we know what he did. He did what he always did. He went out and wept bitterly and said, oh, you can't believe I fell for it again, you know, that sort of thing. But that's the great news of the gospel is that we're flawed. Even God's greatest servants were greatly flawed. And legalism is inherently hypocritical, as Paul points out here. Hypocrisy always tries to make people live up to a standard that even we don't live up to. You know, even we can't. The Jews didn't even obey their own law, but now they're saying, well, we couldn't do it. Let's see if they can do it. You know, let's put it on them. And so Paul reminds here Peter how, where freedom was found for them. He says, you know, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, verse 16, this is a key verse here, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we, even we Jews have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh can be justified. I love Paul. He would have made a great parent because he manages to turn one point into a whole paragraph and say it just like backwards, forwards, and in the middle. It's kind of like he says, look, we came to Christ because you can't be justified by the law because we needed to come not through the law because you can't be uh, justified by the law, but you got to come to Christ. And that's why we came to Christ because you can't be justified through the law. You know, and you go... Yeah, but Paul, what's your point? You know, I, I'm not sure I follow you, Paul. And so he says, Peter, look, we're Jews. We knew the law. These folks don't know the law. But we outwardly obeyed the law, and you know that. The law of Moses, well, we grew up with that stuff. Since we were little kids there in Jerusalem, unlike these Gentiles. And, and guess what? You and I both came to the same conclusion, which is that we need Christ for faith. We need faith in Christ for salvation because the law didn't make either one of us righteous before God and it never could and it never would and Peter if the law didn't free you and the law didn't free me then what makes you think it's going to free them and why would you put on them what you threw off out of your own life so the last point well we see it here it's free others use your freedom to free others freedom's worth fighting for especially in the lives of others see he said be free that's important stay free yeah but why well, not only for your own benefit, but that you might free others. Because, again, we saw legalism is very contagious. It can flow through a whole place and just ruin a work of God. And your freedom isn't just for you. It isn't just for your benefit. It's for the benefit of others, as all gifts of God are. And so we can't free others if we ourselves are bound. If we are bound by legalism, if we are bound by a self-righteousness that we think well, I'm in a little bit better because my quiet time's a little bit longer and a little bit quieter, you know, or that sort of thing. Or, you know, God speaks to me different, or I do these things and all this, and all of a sudden I am on a higher plane than everybody else. See, verse 16, it's the first appearance of a very crucial word that will be discussed for the remainder of the book, so we need to make sure we know it, justified. Three times in the same verse, again, Paul says the same thing with just different emphasis, but he's saying justified. There's a way to be justified and there's a way that won't work. Works won't work, but faith does. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. A blank slate with the Lord. And you see no record of wrongs. That's right standing with God. Not working your way to God, but to be forgiven and free as a free gift of God. Something that God does because of our faith. And so verse 17, he says, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, which Peter was just found a sinner, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Well, certainly not. One of the ways that Paul would 
make his points throughout his books that will help us understand this, is that he would anticipate the arguments of others. He knew what they were. He had been around. He'd been a preacher. He'd heard what people said whenever he preached grace. They said, wait, 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 wait. If you preach grace, people will sin. They will take it as a license to sin. And Paul said, well, can I remind you, people sin with or without a license. Have you, have you ever noticed that? You know, people don't need a license to sin. They don't say, can I see your sinner's license? No, they sin without it. They don't need a license for it. And, you know, he would say that, again, grace, if you take away the law, well, you're going to just, things are going to go nuts. People are going to go crazy. Grace will lead to more sin. And so Paul says, yeah, people have accused us of that. People have said Jesus is going to just lead to crazy sinners. You know, human logic does suggest more law, less sin. But look around. Does it really happen? <laughs> you put more law, and what happens? Our rebellious nature says, oh yeah? Don't, don't walk on grass. Well, <laughs> who's going to stop me? You know? Don't touch the wet paint. Oh yeah? I'm going to wipe my hand on it and put on my clothes. You know, that sort of thing. That's people, more law? more sin. And law and legalism, there's a long human history to look down, has really no power whatsoever to control sin. In fact, in many places, it just fuels the flames. And so grace is the only thing. God's true grace, as we see it in Scripture, is the only thing that has the power over sin. The only thing that can really take away the penalty of sin, but take away the power of sin in a person's life. And the rest of the book of Galatians, it goes into great depth on that truth there. So stay tuned for it. But law can't set us free. But what can? Well, look what he says in verse 18. If I build again these things that I destroy, I make myself a transgressor. In other words, the law just shows my flaw. For through the law, I died to the law that I might live to God. So, Paul's saying, look, Peter or anyone else out there, if I put myself or I try to put somebody else under law, I'm only condemning myself and I'm only condemning them to being condemned because the law can't save or cleanse anybody. The law can only kill us. That's what it does. It kills us. It puts us in jail. It can't justify us. And so once the law of God has brought an end to me. This is the great thing. At the end of me, that's when I can really be free. I can live to God and for God. That's what he's going to have here as a conclusion. That brings us to perhaps one of the most amazing verses in the Bible on how to be free and stay free and free others. You ought to have this one starred. You ought to have it circled. You ought to have it in 3D somehow on your page there. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen to that. Christ in me, he's saying, the hope of glory. Not a bunch of rules outside of me, but Christ inside me. The promise that only Christianity can give. You can look up every other belief system in the world. And it's also, it's always some combination of do this, do this, do this, and you'll be all right with God. External rules, but only Christianity offers the reality of an internal, eternal relationship with Christ. Crucified with Christ. That's where it starts. You go, well, I don't know if I like that. But remember, he's speaking spiritually here. Of course, Paul eventually was uh, beheaded, you know, killed. But he's just, he's actually using a metaphor here. He says, Speaking spiritually, when Jesus died, this is how I see it, this is how God sees it, more importantly. He says, I died with him. The old Paul, dead. Saul, even so dead that he changes his name afterwards. Saul, forget that. Paul. Saul the destroyer? No, Paul the little one. That's what it means. He says, the little guy with the big God. And when, when Jesus died, I died with him. When Jesus rose again, well, I rose with him. And the penalty of sin is gone. Why? Because the law can't hold a dead person. So if you think about it this way, if I you know, drive drunk and crash into a tree and die, well, I, you know, the law has some things against me, but it, it's, you know, the officer isn't going to be writing me a ticket when I'm there against the tree. You know, This is it, buddy. You're going to jail with me. No, I'm going to actually a different place. Because you know what? In a manner of speaking, the death set me free. So I'm free not to sin, 
bad example because, you know, there goes a sinner in there, DUI and all that. But <laughs> the whole thing is freedom, you know. Get the main point of the parable. I am free not to sin, but for the first time in my life in coming to Christ, free not to sin. See, that's the great freedom. Well, I can do whatever I want, you know. Oh, man, the Bible says that we were in bondage in such a way that before we came to Christ, man, we didn't do whatever we wanted. We did whatever the enemy of our soul wanted us to do. And we said, oh, I'm so free, free to be in bondage. And so Christ set us free to live a life, joy, peace, purpose, something that's headed somewhere, free from trying to earn God's love too. See, some people don't live that unrighteous life, you know, that's outward, obvious sinning, but they live under some kind of religious system that somebody's put on them that they say, you got to do all this, and no matter how much you do, you got to do a little bit more. And, you know, that was pretty close. You got a 99.9, but why did you miss that one question? You are, God's kind of mad at you over that one. You know, that sort of thing. Just, you will live under that pressure for your whole life trying to earn God's love. But this is what Paul said, man, I know what that's all about. And he says, I already have God's love. I don't have to earn it. He gave it to me. I couldn't earn it. I can't deserve it. And when I realized that, how free I was. And so freedom's not free. Someone has to die. That's what we see here. Someone has to die physically. Yeah, it's true that throughout the years, many people have died for our freedom. But this is what I'm talking about here. Someone has to die. And the first person who has to die in this scenario here is me. To be free, I, I, I got to come to the end of me. I think of it this way, George Mueller, a name that you should know. Uh, he was a, a, a Christian man who lived uh, by, by great faith, uh, started many orphanages. You know, he wasn't saved by good works, but he sure did a lot of them. And this was a question that someone asked him, hey, how is your life so fruitful? How did you live such a life as you did? How did you see so many prayers answered and all this stuff? He has a great a uh, book about his life called Answers to Prayer, George Mueller. This was his answer. There is a day when I died. He wasn't talking physically here, though, of course, he did eventually die. But he said, I utterly died to George Mueller, to his opinions, to his preferences, to his tastes and will. I died to the world, to its approval and disapproval. See, if you go for people's applause or you listen to their boos, it really keeps you in bondage. He said, I died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. See, peer pressure doesn't only come uh, from the wicked world. Sometimes it comes just from a legalistic person who thinks that they're putting the, uh, you know, the, the obedience of God in you and they're really just doing something different. He says, since then, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. And he says, that's it. I'm audience of one kind of guy. That's what it means to die to self and to live for God. That's true freedom. It's not just what we do, it's why we do it. I think of this, you know, we have different, uh, I guess, rituals, you would call them, or different things that we go through. Some ceremonies, you know, you think of circumcision, we're not really into that one, because Jesus didn't make a big deal of that, but he talked about some other things, baptism being one of them. It was mentioned earlier, we'll be doing one sometime soon. But one of the most profound things that was ever said to me, I always ask people at that time, hey, what brought you to this moment? What brought you to this place? What, what does this moment mean to you right now? You know, water baptism doesn't save you, but it's a celebration of your salvation. That's why we do it. You know, to celebrate what God has already done, not because he's looking and saying, wow, okay, now you can be saved. See, some people would say, boy, don't move the baptism back. What if people don't get baptized? They won't be saved. It's a celebration of what God has already done through faith. But I asked this person, what does this moment mean to you? And they said, well, I did this many years ago out of obligation, out of religious you know, sense of it, it was the right thing to do. But this time, I'm doing it out of love. I said, man, same thing done, same good work, total different reason. And so Paul says, man, this was my motive and this is the only motive that really leads to any lasting change. He says, he loved me, and he gave himself for me. And in essence, Paul's saying, look, he loved me enough to give himself for me. He's going to love me enough to live his life through me. That's it. The law doesn't love me. The law does not love me. All it could do is kill me. But Jesus loved me. And verse 21, this is where it ends for now. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law then Christ died in vain. Wow. You see this, 
Think about it this way. Familiar scene, maybe, if you've seen the movies. Jesus in the garden, you know, praying, facing the cross. Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Well, what if right then there'd been a voice from heaven that said, hey, you know, come to think about it, Jesus. You don't have to tie. Just tell them to be good. Just, just tell them to be good, and that's good enough. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier. Again, I don't make light of it to make light of it. I make light of it to see how foolish that way of thinking could be. To imagine that I could add to Jesus' work on the cross or somehow make it better by some ritual or some good thing I'm doing or have done. That's a terrible insult to God. It shows God to have a, a kind of strange view of the world where he'd send his son and didn't need to because there were other ways around it. And so... You know, if I'm working my way or trying to please God by earning my right, you know, it's kind of like he'd look at me and say, Scott, I gave my son's life for that. And you're trying to buy it for a few pennies? I mean, what's, what's the matter with you? Again, freedom isn't free. It needs to be defended. It needs to be defended in our own minds and lives because it's so easy to let go of what the Scripture teaches us. And it's the only way to really live free. It has a cost and someone has to die. And last year I had an experience in which this truth hit home for me like never before. I was standing in front of a war memorial. You've seen them. Maybe you've done this. A huge granite wall. Countless names on it and more being added all the time. This was one of those living memorials that just kept adding names as, as they were, um, their lives were given. And across the top there, an inscription on it said, All gave some, some gave all. And as I was standing there, a, a family walked up next to me, you know, and they, they were kind of um, more serious, more somber than some. And there was a lady there and a couple of kids with her, you know, and an older couple there in the group, maybe the grandparents, I figured, I don't know. They were carrying flags. Uh, they had flowers and different things, you know. And they weren't just looking at the names. They were looking for a specific name, and they found it while I was standing there. And one of the kids said, there's daddy's name. And suddenly I found myself tearing up and saying just thank you. I don't know if they heard me. I know God heard me. Thank you. I mean that, I, that's all that hit my mind. You know, Freedom isn't free and someone had to die. And spiritually speaking there's a memorial always before us. The cross. The war to end all wars. You know. 2,000 years ago, spiritually, the war to end all wars, the victory that was won. Not many names on that memorial, but one. Not Paul, he didn't die for my sin. Not Peter, he didn't die for my sin. VIP names, you know. Or maybe there's some hero that you have, you know, human hero. But what an insult it is to be looking for any other name there when God says, hey, I found the name. That's my son's name. That's the name on that memorial. See, and when I find that name, and I realize that's God's Son and that's my Savior, then I can say thank you. That's all I can say. I really can't say, well, let, let, me, add, let me add my name in. You know, let me scroll a little, my name in there. You know, that, that I did something, too. No, again, in this case, one gave all. One gave all. It cost the cross. And so often, again, as, as a preacher of grace, as a teacher of grace, you know, Paul heard, we hear it sometimes, cheap grace. You know, you just preach cheap grace because you say it's free, you know, and you, you don't add to that. But, you know, what about all the things that people need to do? You know what, I think when someone realizes all that God has done, you're not going to have to talk to them too much about all they need to do. They'll just be saying thank you with their whole life. Grace is free because we couldn't afford it. That's the point. I couldn't afford it. You couldn't afford it. Paul couldn't afford it. Peter can't afford it. It's too expensive to buy. It's priceless. And if you and I try to write a check for it, it's going to bounce. It's going to say NSF on it. You know, insufficient funds. Because it costs the cross. That's how expensive spiritual freedom is. And Paul puts it so strongly that we should never forget. He says, if you try to add to it, you subtract from it. And you're really saying Jesus died in vain. Now, it's an unthinkable thing to say that to anyone when someone has sacrificed so much for me to have turned to that family and said, you know, he probably died in vain. You'd say, that is unthinkable for you to have done that. I didn't. But that's basically what I'm saying to God if I 
try to take away from all that Jesus has done. See, the personal nature of that statement Paul made, he loved me and gave himself for me. I now live because Christ lives in me. Can you say that as personally as Paul did? Well, we're going to close our eyes. We're going to bow our heads. And just as we close out in these closing moments, I'm going to give an opportunity for anyone here in this room to make that decision, that declaration that says, hey, I want to be free. Maybe you were brought up in a religious system. Maybe you thought, okay, if I do this, if I don't eat that on this day, then you know, I'll be okay. Or because I have a card that I carry that says I was baptized as this or did this or I went to my first something or I have a nice picture of me uh, in a dress, you ladies, uh, you know, or, or whatever. And, and that's, that's the reason. You know, I, I can point to those things in my life. Well, you know, again, all of that is just simply saying that Jesus somehow died in vain. If that's our ticket, if good is good enough, then why did Jesus die? But we see in the scripture that Jesus did die and he rose again. Why? Because we needed to die to ourself, to our self-righteousness, to our sin, so that we might live to the new life that he gives and lives through us. That is the promise. So again, as clear as I can put it, is he in you? He can be here tonight. What is it? Just an opportunity for you to open your heart, open your life, acknowledge your need, and settle the issues of eternity here. Well, Father, I thank you for an opportunity here, again, for us to fight for our freedom in the sense that, Lord, our hearts can so often be taken away from this and how easy it is for us to subtly fall back into the trap of thinking that if I do this, God will love me more. Or because I did that, God loves me less. But what a mistake that is in our life. What a diminishing that is of your grace. So Lord, I pray that we would embrace your grace like never before, that we would walk in enough freedom, in the kind of freedom, that others would be drawn to you. Because Lord, you did say, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. You didn't say, I'll add such a long list, you'll never know where to stop. So God, thank you for that promise that you have for each one of us. And may we carry that torch of freedom and fight for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you a homework assignment right here uh, as you go home. Just this week, let the Lord love you for no reason at all other than the fact that he does. Don't try to earn it. Don't try to deserve it. Just enjoy it. God bless you guys.